Hey, good evening to everyone, and thank you very much for coming to this book lunch, which means a lot to me, it means, I think, a lot to you, but above all, it means a lot to this field of sovereign debt management and sovereign debt restructuring, which really equals to this career, or this career equals to the development of sovereign debt management and restructuring. And for me, it's always a distinct pleasure to introduce Lee. And over the last years, I have had the privilege of listening to him in what I would call virtuoso performances in front of my students, in front of policy makers, and in front of fellow colleagues. He always elicits boundless admiration. Lee is unique, and so is this book. Lee all of you who know here in this audience, in this distinguished audience, to be the consummate professional, the maestro in his field. The New York Times called him the philosopher king of sovereign debt, mm -hmm. and the Guardian called him the fairy godmother to finance ministers in distress. <laughs> Lee is also one of my best professional friends, one to whom I owe not only my entire knowledge in this field, but also enormous appreciation for his endless generosity with me and my students over the years, first in New York, where I had the <coughs> privilege of meeting him, and then here in London. This book, Sovereign Debt Management, is intended as a liberal amicorum in honor of Lee Wuhan. Somewhat unusually for a liberal decorum, we, and by we I mean Oxford University Press and myself, asked Lee both to serve as co-editor and contribute to a volume in his honor. That's the only reason why his name does not come first. He insisted. In this particular case, I insisted otherwise, but on this one he got his way through. He kindly agreed to serve as co-editor and contributor and to have him honor in this way. But as I wrote in the preface to the book, the rationale for having him as co-editor is very clear. For more than three decades, he started as a teenager, Lee's professional life has been the life of sovereign debt. As we all know, beginning in 1982 with the Latin American debt crisis, Lee has been involved, I have to say, usually as counsel to the debtors. I know that there are hedge fund managers in this room, and they know that very well, in most of the sovereign debt workouts of the last 30 years. And virtually every innovation in this field, from collective action clauses, aggregated collective action clauses, asset consents, and more recently, the final pass debate, bears this distinctive mark. And as none other than John Taylor, who is the father of his eponymous rule, the Taylor Rule in Monetary Policy, and also former Under Secretary of Treasury under the first Bush administration, writing in the forward says, Lee Wuhai's long experience has given him unique insights and a special appreciation for the incentives that drive policy makers in these situations. That is why he is so often called on and listened to. There is a certain tragic inevitability to the process. When you brief him on the details of a particular sovereign debt case, and I'm quoting John Taylor, and explain the positions of all parties, and then listen to his reaction, you know you're talking to someone who has seen this movie before. Talking about debt, since the debt is always owed to one's parents, and I know that Lee was very fond of his parents, let me recall, and you can read his short biographical note at the beginning, that Lee was born in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and that his father and mother, Charles Buchheit and Helen Willard Buchheit, they met during the Second World War, and they were both officers, and they promised that if they both survived the war, they would marry. And it was, as he confesses in, the, in his own biographical notes, there was, there was no doubt his parents worked and experience that influenced Lee's first chosen profession, which was not as a lawyer, but as a soldier. And at the age of 17, he won a scholarship from the U.S. Army. The U.S. Army then funded his education, 
but it was not law, but philosophy that became this major during his studies at Middlebury. And his choice of profession at that time was to be an academic philosopher. No wonder then that the New York Times called him the philosopher king of sovereign debt. He approaches sovereign debt not just with the minutia of a good lawyer, which he is, but also with that broader vision that a philosopher has. One of his philosophy professors at Middlebury advised him to attend law school. I would like to know the name of this professor, because we should all be grateful for him, for his advice that he should do law and perhaps then return to philosophy. But today, as he lectures us on sovereign debt in the light of eternity, the title of the last chapter of the book, he reconnects his extraordinary legal career with the philosophical underpinnings that have always appealed to him and that make him so special. The rest of the talk is going to be me talking, as you would all expect, and then I will just say a few words at the end to uh, guide us back to have some drinks in, in honor of this book. Thank you. Thank you, Rosa, for those very kind words. Prentice, it's wonderful to be with you. Thank you for coming. Uh, let me begin uh, by thanking Rosa. Uh, Rosa's name and my name appear on the cover of this book in the same typeface. But if there were any justice in the universe, and if the typeface reflected our relative contributions to what's in it, <laughs> it would take a jeweler to read my name. <laughs> the roses would be two inches tall. From its, in from its conception, from its inception, and now to its reception, this has been Rose's project. And I have been privileged to tag along. Uh, but uh, be under no illusion as to who is uh, the primary author of this project. Uh, let me also thank the authors uh, who have contributed to this volume, all of them very busy, uh, but they did a splendid job, uh, and uh, uh, I think the result shows it. And finally, let me extend our thanks to our splendid team of editors and staff at the Oxford University Press, uh, who prodded our delinquencies with a degree of politeness but firmness that eventually got the book done. Toward the end of the process, Rosa had asked me to write a final chapter for the book that would be philosophic reflections upon sovereign debt. I decided to take as my cue the great Dutch philosopher of the 17th century, Benedict Spinoza. Spinoza firmly believed that one cannot properly understand an idea unless it is understood sub specia eternitatis, in the light of eternity. So I said, allow me to step back from sovereign debt, from essentially all I've done in my professional career, and offer you a few reflections on the state of sovereign debt as it exists in 2014. First, the moral element. At the heart of all sovereign borrowing is an intergenerational tension. It's very simple. The folks who borrow the money are often not the folks who have to repay it. No one minds very much when sovereigns incur debt to build a bridge or to build a road or to fight a war, uh, at, least not, uh, at least one that is not a discretionary war. Nor do most people mind if the sovereign borrows to finance economic stimulus in the face of a depression or a severe recession. But the practice of borrowing money to cover chronic budget deficits, even in periods of prosperity, uh, is nothing more than essentially borrowing from the next generation in order to ease the path of this generation 
through this veil of tears. It is, of course, uh, the least uh, politically objectionable path, uh, the other two paths being uh, frugality uh, or uh, taxation. This is a relatively recent phenomenon in most of our countries, certainly in the United States. The ethos of the United States for most of its history was that borrowing at the level of the federal government would be constrained. Uh, we had no aversion to it. We would we borrowed to finance the Revolutionary War, the War of 1812, the Civil War, the First World War. We borrowed to get out of the Depression. But in each case, there was a direct link between some immediate emergency uh, and the need to incur debt, and there followed, in every case, the discipline uh, to repay those debts, uh, sometimes even more quickly than we ought to have. It is relatively recently that we have become accustomed to borrowing to cover chronic budget deficits simply because uh, that is an easier path than, um, than taxation or, or frugality. The sin is not just uh, the accretion of larger and larger debt stocks. Part of this sin is that a sovereign's financial strength, its economic strength, even its military, strength lies not in the debt that it's put on its books, it lies in its capacity to borrow. What the economists call its fiscal space, the ability to borrow, to face a future emergency uh, at reasonable interest rates. For every country, in every time, including my own, there will come a point of saturation in the markets where the markets will become unwilling to lend at uh, low interest rates in order to continue financing deficits. Don't you see what we've done? What we have done is effectively preclude the succeeding generations from their own capacity to borrow because I promise you, in their lives, there will be recessions, there will be wars, there will be natural disasters, and they will occasionally need to borrow in order to deal with them and the practice of taking on massive uh, legacy debts has to some degree crimped their fiscal space uh, in the future. The legal element. It was not so long ago, roughly 40 years, that most of our countries decided that sovereigns that enter the commercial market and behave as commercial actors should be held accountable for their actions in foreign courts. It was called the restrictive theory of sovereign immunity. Before that, before that, this is only about 40 years ago, friends, uh, sovereigns benefited from absolute sovereign immunity. You could not sue a foreign sovereign in your courts without its consent. Uh, that is the theory that would have been instantly recognizable to Ramses II of Egypt or Louis XIV of France. We changed that uh, in this country. It was codified only in 1978 in the United States, 1976, to say that foreign sovereigns that can be sued uh, when they enter into commercial contracts abroad. A creditors, an aggrieved creditors, redress against a sovereign before that change of law was frankly political. You would go to the State Department, you would go to the Foreign Office or the equivalent in your country, and you would say to your diplomats, you must uh, bring pressure to bet upon those scoundrels in Ruritania who are not paying my bonds. Uh, and that was the response. We, we all know that it reached a kind of ugly zenith in the very early part of the 20th century, uh, when some states uh, took upon themselves the belief 
that it was appropriate to use military force to compel foreign sovereigns to pay not debts to the government that was sending in the gunboats, but rather to private investors in that country. <coughs> so one way of looking at the change was that the diplomats, who had for centuries had this monkey on their back, successfully moved it over to the judiciary. <laughs> now they could say to the irate bondholder, come not to us. Mm -hmm. You can now go to a, a high court judge, a federal court judge, uh, or whoever, and they will hear the case. And up to a point, it's true. Mm -hmm. uh, if a sovereign debt default is isolated, uh, it is appropriately dealt with by the judicial mechanism. But the problem is that the judiciary is wholly inequipped to deal with a, global, a generalized sovereign debt restructuring in one country, much less one region. Uh, you see, judges view their role as rather pedestrian. They get paid to, to apply the law. And the law in all of our countries, when it comes to debts, is rather pedestrian. It is that the borrowing of money connotes an obligation to repay the money. Mm -hmm. And if you don't repay the money, uh, the creditor is entitled to the <coughs> You want to have some fun someday, you go into a high court courtroom, you go into a federal courtroom in the United States when a, when a sovereign debt case is being argued. Uh, and you will see the lawyer for the sovereign stand up and they will make a, an emotional plea. And they will say, Your Honor, if you give judgment against my client, the Republic of Ruritania, uh, Ruritania is in a crisis. It will possibly bring down Ruritania. It could destabilize the region. It could cause financial panic around the world. Uh, it could bring essentially the end of Western civilization. Uh, as we know it, the Cossacks will be grazing their horses on Montmartre. Whatever your definition of the end of the world is, that's the French uh, and after this tsunami of rhetoric passes over the head of the judge, something like this happens. The judge puts his or her glasses on, and he looks down at you, and he says, son, did you borrow the money? And you say, si, sí, senor. And he said, did you repay it? And you say, judgment. <laughs> judiciary applying that basic legal principle to deal with a generalized sovereign debt crisis. Why? Because the sovereign debt crisis, its resolution, requires contributions from various stakeholders, surely from the official sector, but from the citizens of the afflicted country. Uh, you read every day in the newspaper about the reaction to austerity that is being imposed on some of the peripheral countries in Europe, the citizens of the country pay a huge price. Uh, now, to be fair, so will the creditors, but the judgment as to the, uh, the allocation of the burden sharing among these three principal stakeholders cannot be done by a judge. You see, they, I, I'm not criticizing they're doing what we pay them to do, but they cannot, under their own rules, have a wide enough peripheral vision to take into account uh, all of these other consequences and to reach the enormous, delicate, and political judgments as to how much burden share, how much austerity can you uh, uh, apply, uh, how much can be asked from the official sector, and how much in light of that is appropriate uh, from the creditors. One final comment on this. The fact that we have set up the sovereign debt regime to say that there are judicial remedies is, of course, at the heart of much of the headline commotion about sovereign debt. Uh, we all know that sovereign debt crises eventually get resolved through some coordinated uh, approach 
but the individual creditors will always be holding pieces of paper that are legal, valid, binding, and enforceable under someone's legal system. <coughs> Therefore, absent any mechanism, and we have no mechanism, uh, similar to a bankruptcy code, which would allow uh, dissident minority creditors to be forced to follow the judgment of the uh, collective uh, aggregate uh, of their fellow creditors, absent that mechanism, to use the phrase the cram mechanism, uh, we have no way of forcing them, and therefore, uh, under the current regime, they can go to a court, uh, they can get a judgment, and they can seek to enforce that judgment uh, with all of the consequences that you see, most of the headlines. You will see the deal with sovereign debt uh, reflect, reflect that fact. We are trying as a community uh, to deal with that problem uh, by inserting clauses in uh, sovereign debt contracts that will allow the collective will of the supermajority of creditors to control the process, but it has been a, a, a difficult task and we're not there yet. The financial element, this too, is relatively new. A sovereign debtor today, uh, certainly from the developed world, but also increasingly in emerging markets, does not borrow money with the expectation that when it matures, it will repay it out of its current revenues. They borrow money in the sure, well, not sure, they borrow money in the hope and expectation that when it matures, they will find someone else to lend them the money to pay the old creditor, and then when that debt matures, they'll find someone to lend them that money as well. That, too, is relatively new, certainly for emerging market countries, but it has this implication. Credit markets are skittish. They are fickle. They are occasionally ignorant. They will cease living to a sovereign, uh, sometimes for reasons that have nothing whatever to do with that sovereign's own financial behavior. Uh, the markets will look around the world. They may see a Lehman moment in financial markets generally. They may be troubled by some geopolitical development that causes them to turn arthritic. Uh, there may be a natural disaster. Uh, the markets may derive a lesson out of the misbehavior or gross misfortune of some other sovereign elsewhere in the world. And as a result of that, uh, they will not lend freely uh, to a particular sovereign, and at that point, friends, there are very few choices left. At that point, the choices are, if the sovereign can find someone in the official sector to bail it out, uh, and that's what they can do. If they've issued the debt in their own currency, I guess they can inflate it away, or they can default, default and restructure it. But it means this. That when an investor looks at a sovereign, they're no longer making a judgment necessarily about that sovereign's financial strength and policies and prospects. They're making a judgment about whether that sovereign will, at some point in the future, on some date in the future, be able to go into the market to refinance its debt. Everything has come down to an assumption of refinancing. Uh, and, uh, Fiscal uh, discipline, fiscal recklessness is relevant really only insofar as it either uh, augments or erodes the confidence that those future investors might have uh, before they lend uh, uh, to the country. This has introduced a degree of fragility into our financial system and that was not there 50 years ago. 50 years ago. When a bank would consider lending to a sovereign borrower, 
banquet's first ask, what, uh, how will the sovereign repay this debt? Meaning, by what revenue stream will my repayment come from? Uh, the bank would typically say, I'm not going to take the risk that uh, on one date in the future, on the maturity date, you, the sovereign, will not have the capacity to refinance. And so the banks would structure the transactions so that uh, a portion of the principal due on the debt was paid over time, annually. Uh, they were called amortizing loans. In some cases, particularly in 19th or early 20th centuries, the debtor would be required to make incremental payments to a trustee in what was called a sinking fund, in effect building up an amount of money so that when the final maturity date came, uh, not ever, uh, the lender was not holding his breath, wondering whether the sovereign could refinance it. But we have insensibly weaned ourselves from that sort of, of, of behavior. The truth is, the market today uh, likes to trade bonds that mature on one day. They don't like, uh, they can't easily price the mechanics of sinking funds and so forth. They're called bullet repayments. And the assumption in everyone's mind is that, uh, is that the debt will be able to be refinanced. One final uh, contributor, I think, to this uh, phenomenon once upon a time, when a banker lent you money, the banker assumed that he was going to be there when it matured and you would pay it. No mas amigos. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in the world of bond lenders, uh, the initial lender doesn't actually worry about that maturity date in the future. They would listen to what I just said, and they would say, Lee, I don't really feel at risk uh, of that, uh, of having an unsustainably large bullet repayment on the maturity day. Why? Because, this is true ubiquitously among hedge fund managers, uh, every one of them believes themselves to be smarter than every other. Yeah. And so the gamble is not uh, that I'm gambling on your ability to refinance the <coughs> The gambling is that I'll know when the getting is good and I will sell out long, long before that. A footnote to this, a friend of mine, Felix Sam, uh, and an economist friend of his, did a little study uh, that had a very crude calculation. It said that if you took the budget deficits and the maturing debt of a particular country and divided that by the country's reserve position, in effect, the cash on hand that they have. How long, Felix asked, would countries be able, out of their reserves, to continue paying their debt and covering their deficits if they were entirely cut off for market access? what the economists call a sudden stop. If everything ceased, how long would they last? Well, uh, India would last about two weeks. Uh, Mexico, about the same. Uh, the land of the free and the home of the brave, the United States, would last 17 weeks. Mm -hmm. Germany actually would go on for several years. But if you look at that chart, it is frightening just how thin the reserve positions are vis-a-vis -vis the liabilities that these countries have incurred. Because the initial instinct, of course, of any politician in the face of a, 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 a cessation of credit flows is not to restructure. I promise you that. Those of you who think that sovereigns sit around looking for excuses to restructure, uh, restructure they do everything they can to avoid it. Uh, their initial instinct is to run down the reserves, uh, to uh, uh, pretend to the market uh, that all is well, in the hopes that the interruption will be temporary and ephemeral. Um, sometimes it is, I suppose. Sometimes it isn't. 
But any good economist will tell you that if you have to enter a sovereign debt restructuring, it is far better to do it with some reserves than to have res run reserves negative before you, before you start the process. Final comment, but one that you, we all know too well, the political element. The, polit the hard political reality of sovereign debt is that politicians like to be elected and re-elected. Spending money contributes to their getting elected and re-elected. Taxing operates against being elected and re-elected. Result, to the extent that you can continue to provide services and can avoid taxation, uh, to do that by borrowing becomes the path of least resistance. This is an inherent weakness in all of our democracies. Because you ask yourself, what break is there? What inhibition is there on a politician from smoothing his or her own path uh, by simply borrowing and, in effect, allowing uh, some future generation to have to deal with the problem? It is almost comical, at least in my country, uh, to see the, the politicians attempting to put breaks upon themselves. So you will have uh, uh, debt ceiling. You all just saw that play out horribly, where there is a debt ceiling the federal government needs to, the executive branch needs to get Congress to agree to borrow more. It just happened at the end of last year, and Felix Salmon's assumption that the United States would last about 17 weeks turned out to be exactly right. <laughs> uh, unable to borrow, uh, the, the, the government was going to have to start defaulting on someone. They never said who. They never said whether it was bondholders or pensioners. Uh, or suppliers or someone else, but someone was was not going to get uh, uh, was not going to get paid in full. It is a weakness of our democracies, uh, and you see politicians put debt ceilings uh, every now and again. There's this spasmodic kind of reaction that we must have pay as you go legislation. We must have balanced budget amendments to the Constitution. Uh, to take the European example, we must have hard fiscal deficit uh, percentages that, that are punished uh, when countries go above them. It is, of course, wholly discreditable to the political class that they should uh, uh, be forced to do things, because after all, they're putting constraints on themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, it, best example, it is the dieter. Uh, who every night before they go to bed tapes the refrigerator door shut mm -hmm. uh, in an effort to control themselves. Of course, somehow, uh, usually in the morning, the tape is flapping. Uh, but but uh, not, nonetheless, uh, the, the problem is there. And in this uh, really quite short space of time, you have seen debt stocks in many countries, uh, in the developed world and in the emerging market world, have grown with a relentless, remorseless accretion. And you must ask yourself, uh, what will happen to those debt stocks? Yeah. If you say they will be repaid by future generations, that's just another way of saying uh, that they will have to be taxed more or work harder uh, or forego services or be unable to deal with the crises that will happen during their own lives. Why? Uh, because we chose not to discommode ourselves now. Uh, or, if they don't pay it, uh, maybe you can justify it by saying, well, son, when your time comes, you can refinance it, and you can then uh, carry on or pass on an even uh, larger debt stock uh, to your Posterity, that, uh, that has to have an, an obvious end point. Maybe they'll be lucky enough to inflate it away, but, but be under no illusion, inflation is just another way of defaulting and restructuring. It's just 
just let less visible or maybe when their time comes uh, they are going to have to sit down and incur uh, the odious title of a sovereign debt restructure something that we uh, have chosen not to embrace uh, in our time friends those are my philosophic reflections on our little business now I experienced enough lawyer to know that I should not stand between a group this large in alcohol any longer than I should, so I'm going to turn it back to my friend. Also.